Do you dream of becoming a doctor, but the thought of taking a medical board exam freaks you out? Don't worry, it scared me too. But today I'm gonna help prepare you for what's to come. Whether you're six years or six months away from taking the USMLE, the United States Medical Licensing Exam, which is required to become a doctor in the United States, I made this video for you. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I prepared for and aced these exams. And by ace, I mean I scored a little bit above the average and I survived these horrible board exams. My name is Jake Goodman. I'm a psychiatry resident doctor who recently passed my step three board exam. That's the third and final USMLE board exam. Throughout medical school and residency, I've completed more than 7,000 practice questions and I spent hundreds if not thousands of hours preparing for these horrible exams. These tests can determine whether you're gonna attain your dream of becoming a physician. So any edge you can gain during this brutal process can be the difference between passing and failing. And trust me, you do not want to have to retake one of these exams. In today's video, I'm gonna demonstrate two awesome resources that help you attain and retain in your brain the vital information that you need to ace these exams. I'm gonna walk you through how I use them by stepping through a question bank tool from TrueLearn and showing you how they partner with Picmonic, a visual mnemonic learning tool. Individually, each of these resources are an incredible asset, but when they're used together, they give you the ultimate study hack to help you ace these exams and continue your pursuit of your medical career goals. So fam, let's get it. Since my specialty is psychiatry, I'm gonna be using mental health associated questions during this demonstration. We're in the USMLE Step 1 Question Bank module of TrueLearn's online test prep tool. You're presented with a series of multiple choice questions that pose realistic scenarios. It's your job to select the correct answer. Let's take a look at a few questions. All right, so question number one, a 37 year old woman comes to the hospital with altered mental status. Her husband says that she has a history of chronic low back pain and takes oxycodone at home for her pain. Recently, she has experienced more lower back pain and has needed to take more pain pills for breakthrough pain. Opioid overdose is suspected and naloxone, also called Narcan, is administered in the emergency room. Which of the following symptoms is associated with acute opiate overdose? All right, pause the video, everyone. Look at the answer choices. And when you think you found the right answer, unpause the video and we'll get to it. All right, y'all, let's get into these answer choices. So A, diarrhea. This is wrong. Let's go ahead and strike this out. Opiates cause the opposite reaction. They cause constipation. Opiates slow things down. They slow down your GI tract. They slow down your respiration. You would not expect to see diarrhea with opiates. Now B, decreased bowel sounds. That looks pretty promising because opiates cause constipation. They slow down the GI tract, poop gets stuck, and that's gonna cause decreased bowel sounds. You're not gonna have the active bowel sounds that you have with something like diarrhea. So let's keep moving. B looks promising, but we're gonna look at C, increased respiratory rate. Remember, opiates slow things down. You would expect to see decreased respiratory rate, which is actually the most common cause of death from opiates. Decreased respiratory rate, eventually you can stop breathing and you can die and that's when you administer Narcan, which is a competition for a different day. Okay, so D, increased tidal volume. Nope, tidal volume is the amount of air that circulates throughout the lungs with each respiratory cycle. Opiates, they don't cause an increase in tidal volume, they actually cause a decrease in tidal volume. Pupillary dilation. So with opiates, you'd actually expect the pupil to constrict. It's also called meiosis. To see pupillary dilation, you'd expect that with more like stimulant drugs. So no, pupillary dilation is not correct. We'll go back to B, decreased bowel sounds. Let's see if it's the right answer. All right, and yes, we nailed it. It's B, it's decreased bowel sounds. Something that's important to know here is that acute opiate toxicity can present with the following symptoms. Altered mental status, respiratory depression, decreased bowel sounds, constipation, meiosis. When a patient presents with respiratory depression and a depressed central nervous system, you would administer Narcan, also called naloxone. It is an antidote for opiate overdose and it is an absolutely life-saving treatment. All right, now let's scroll down and see where this collaboration between TrueLearn and Picmonic kicks in. Here you see a number of Picmonic videos related to the question that you just answered. Picmonic videos leverage scientifically proven learning tactics known as mnemonics. Mnemonics are tools that help us memorize specific things or absorb large amounts of information. They can come in the forms of rhymes, acronyms, images, or phrases. So much of medicine, of what I've learned in both medical school and residency, come from mnemonics. It's really incredible. Picmonic is masterful at using these tricks to help internalize the massive amount of information that you learn in medical school and that's required to pass your board exams. 
All right, let's take a look. An addiction, the addict in the attic. Opioid use can also lead to pupillary constriction, known as meiosis, the mice eyes. Constipation, the corked con toilet, is a common complaint by patients taking these medications. Let's take a look at question number two. A 42-year-old man calls his primary care physician. He explains that he's been experiencing some tough times and says he cannot seem to get out of this hole. He explains that he's been struggling since his wife filed for divorce eight months ago because she had fallen in love with another man. He said that the divorce was, quote, ugly and that he, quote, only gets to see his kids two days a week now. He feels hopeless that things could ever improve. All he wants to do is sleep and he skipped work today because he just could not get out of bed. In addition to developing therapeutic rapport, which of the following initial actions by the physician is most appropriate? All right, pause the video, everyone. Take a look at the answers and hit play when you're ready to discuss. Okay, let's assess the potential answer choices here. A, ask the patient about his energy level and appetite. Based on the information the patient shared, he's already telling you he's depressed. He's sharing a lot of the symptoms of depression. Changes in sleep, changes in concentration, mood. We're going to keep this answer for now because it's not a bad answer, but we're going to keep on moving. B. Ask the patient if he would like to be voluntarily hospitalized. This is not a good answer. Before you even consider hospitalization, we need to figure out if this patient is in a mental health crisis, i.e. if they are suicidal. Which brings us to C. Assess the patient for suicidality. This seems like the most logical answer here. I really like this answer, but we're going to keep on moving just to make sure that D and E are not better answers. D, offer to schedule an appointment with him later in the day. This would make sense if there was an opening in the schedule, maybe, but no, we're leaving too much up to chance here. If this patient is suicidal, we need to know that and we're not gonna wait until later to schedule an appointment. So I'm gonna eliminate this. And E, prescribe a low dose escitalopram, also called Lexapro, one of the most common antidepressants. Probably not the best choice here. We need to evaluate for suicidality before we even think about treatment. All right, so we are gonna submit C, suicidality. Let's see if we're right. And as you can see, we are correct here. So 73% of people around the world also chose C, assess the patient for suicidality. Whenever you talk to anybody that opens up about depression, anxiety, you should always assess for suicidality. So now we're gonna scroll down and you're just gonna see several Picmonic videos associated with suicide risk factors. Here's one on suicide assessment. The lack of a support system shown by the no supportive friends there to catch him can lead to feelings of isolation and increased suicidal feelings. Access to firearms or medications increase the likelihood of an individual carrying out a suicide plan, shown by him having easy access to guns and med bottles. Previous or current substance abuse also places individuals at increased risk of suicide and is represented by the substance abuser he's hanging out with. Picmonic videos include an educational overview of the subject matter, the story that reinforces the information using creative mnemonic tricks, and a quiz feature that tests you on your newfound knowledge. So basically, you get three rounds of review, which is very effective tools to help you remember the info you'll need to pass your board exams. All right, let's take a look at the third and final question here. A 27-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by his very distressed wife. She claims that he's been acting out of the ordinary for the past week. She reports that he barely slept and has spent a large sum of money gambling online. He has never been a gambler in the past, but today he says he's on his way to becoming the next World Series of Poker champion. He plans to go to Las Vegas to compete where he's confident he is gonna win. While listening to this patient, the physician has difficulty getting a word in as the patient is speaking very quickly and jumping from one idea to another. His wife says that he has no past medical history, but does know that he has become sullen for a few weeks at a time and does not want to interact with family members or friends. His temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 Fahrenheit. Pulse is 80, respiration 14 per minute, blood pressure 120 over 80. On physical exam, skin reveals no rashes or ulcerations. Pupils are equal, round, reactive to light, and cardiovascular exam reveals regular rate and rhythm. A urine drug screen is negative. Based on his symptoms, what is the patient's most likely diagnosis? All right, y'all, stop the video, take a look at the answer choices, and hit play when you're ready. All right, let's assess the potential answers here. A, bipolar one disorder. Bipolar one disorder is characterized by a manic episode. This patient appears to be manic. He's exhibiting a lot of the signs of mania, the grandiosity, the lots of energy, flight of ideas, very talkative. Probably the right answer, but we're gonna keep on moving. B, bipolar two disorder. Bipolar two disorder is characterized by hypomania. Doesn't meet the full extent to mania. I don't think it's bipolar two, but we're gonna keep it on there for now. 
C, brief psychotic disorder. It's usually stress related, by the way. It's brief psychotic disorder can resemble schizophrenia. You can have the psychosis, the hallucinations, the delusions. This patient is not so much hallucinating or having unusual thought process. We're gonna probably eliminate brief psychotic disorder. Plus, this isn't brief. This has been going on for a longer period of time. Meth intoxication. Urine drug screen was negative here. We're gonna keep on moving. PCP intoxication. So theoretically, PCP and meth can escape a urine drug screen, but for the purposes of the test, probably not gonna do that to you. We can eliminate both of those. We are gonna go with A, bipolar one disorder. Let's submit. We are correct. Bipolar one disorder, A. So when you scroll down here, you can actually see the associated pygmonic videos to help you understand and memorize the information you'll need for your exam and your future medical career. Let's do it. You notice that bipolar bear's neurotransmitters are dysregulated, but today he's happy. So happy, in fact, he's frolicking in a field of you flowers. Filled with endless energy, he runs around the clock until something catches his eye. It was a fluttering flock of ideas flying in the air. Bipolar Bear was so happy to see them that he couldn't help but say all the positive thoughts he was thinking. Okay, y'all, I've walked you through how the True Learn Question Bank and Picmonic videos complement each other, and I shared my thought process for answering the questions. But I'm a doctor, and I've done thousands of these questions, and I've seen a lot of this stuff in real life. What if you're not as experienced or just haven't internalized the information yet? How does True Learn and Picmonic help you do so? Well, when, the re when you review the results of the test, you're provided detailed explanations of symptoms, diagnoses, and how to use that information to determine why each answer is correct or incorrect. You'll also see how your answers and test scores compare with your peers using these tools. You can review or retake your test to gauge your progress. Can you absorb all this information without the resources like TrueLearn and Pygmonic? Of course, students have been doing that for decades before these tools were even created. But today, when you have these affordable learning resources at your fingertips, why would you want to study the old fashioned way? Well, that's the behind the scenes at how I prepare for these critical and stressful board exams that have a huge impact on your medical career. You can see how resources like TrueLearn and Picmonic can help you attain and retain the vital information that you need. If you're interested in learning more, head to the description of this video. I hope this video was helpful for you. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And if this resonated with you, hit thumbs up, share it with a friend, and consider subscribing to my channel. Good luck on your journey.